What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. On today's episode, we have got on a returning guest. He is the nomad capitalist, the one and only Andrew Henderson, live in person. How good are you doing? To, good to see you in uh, Montenegro. No doubt, man. Good to see you. Yeah, pleasure. No doubt, man. We meet, we meet in person at last. It's a good thing. No doubt, man. So I've had you on the podcast before, but for people who are not familiar, who don't know what the nomad capitalist is, who don't know what you're about, can you give people a little bit of an overview? We're about go where you're treated best. Those are the five magic words. We have a business that helps people legally reduce their taxes, moving to places all around the world. We've helped people move to 31 tax-friendly countries, so it's more than just Dubai. There's plenty of countries in Europe, Latin America, Asia that are tax-friendly. Um, we help people get second citizenship. Uh, we help people diversify their assets. So if you're Nigel Farage and you can't get a bank account in the UK, uh, you know where do you bank? You know if you want to protect your assets with trusts, you know thinking internationally. Mm -hmm. And my philosophy is the world is your oyster. You've got a lot of countries that when we were born, nobody would have given a second thought to. Now they've become at least niche players. They're good in at least one thing. It's the best place to mine Bitcoin. It's the best place to you know meet somebody. It's the best place to start a certain kind of business. And so beyond what we do as a company, go where you're treated best means if you're not happy with the way your country's going, if you're not happy with your, you know, the, the social connections you have there, uh, the dating, uh, whatever it can be, go where you're treated best. And my philosophy is that's probably going to be different places. Where you live, where you bank, where you invest, um, those are all going to be different. Yeah. I feel like since the last time we talked, a lot of things have been going on. Some pretty high pretty profile. Crazy. Yeah, some pretty high profile situations with various people, some famous, some not so famous, which are making it clearer, at least in my perspective, and I think for other people who at least are open to thinking in this way, to understand some of the problems with only being, only having access to one place, having a single, single passport, single residency, and not even having any alternative options outside of that. We've seen people's bank accounts being frozen. We've seen increased censorship, people being banned on various platforms, oftentimes with no clear reason. Um, not so long ago, fewer than two years ago, we had the whole Canadian trucker situation where people were getting their bank accounts frozen for protesting. Uh, you mentioned the Nigel Farage situation. For people who may not know what's going on there, can you actually give a little bit of a background on that one? Well, my philosophy, and I've, and I've been thinking this for 25 years, my parents and I, we talk about this around the dinner table, the West is going to become less relevant. Mm. That's partially because other countries, Nigeria, Indonesia, Russia, China, India, Brazil, and others, smaller ones, are becoming more relevant. We hire many of them, for example. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing this kind of marginal decline in the geopolitical and economic power of the West. Still obviously very powerful. I'm not saying they're going to be going to zero. Yeah. But what happens when you see, for example, turn of the century, I think it was 71% of the world reserve, you know, currently was in dollars. Now it's 56%. Mm. That happened a little bit at a time, the frog in the boiling pot. What happens when an entire uh, once powerful, all powerful political system, the only powers in the world, what happens when they get tested? Well, it's like a, like a tiger, you know, pushed into a corner. They have to lash out. And I think you're seeing that dissent is less and less tolerated. We've got to follow the official line. Politicians are these sort of godlike figures in places like the US, Canada, Australia. Um, you're not allowed to ask questions. Now, we can argue, you know, maybe there's some people where some of the questions, it gets to become a little bit too much, but who's to say it should be, you know, that's a personal opinion. Should that be what we make policy based on? Uh, so I think what you're seeing is uh, the government is both overconfident and also, I think, running scared, perhaps. And they're saying, we have to, you know, I don't think they're hiding it anymore also, mm -hmm. you know, where uh, if, we, if you don't agree with us, if you're doing the wrong things, we're going we're gonna to do stuff to you. And it's become acceptable to do that. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that's the way it is everywhere in the world. I don't think that, uh, you know, being on one side of the aisle or the other, if you were to bank in some other country, would really garner much, much concern. So people who thought, hey, Canada is the best, the US is the best, Australia is the best, there's no, this nomad guy, he's kind of crazy, it's still the best country in the world here. <laughs> hey, that's great. Don't you want to at least hedge your bets a little bit? Because mm -hmm. what are you going to, how are you going to hire a lawyer to try and get your bank account reinstated if you don't have any money to pay them? Wouldn't it be nice to have some money somewhere else, for example? Yeah. Something I've noticed is I, I think that there are many people out there, um, specifically in the USA, but I think across all countries, who think the sort of idea of having backup options or alternatives 
is somehow unpatriotic, right? There's this sort of mentality, look, I was born here, I'll live here, I'll fight every fight, I will die here, no matter what, stand your ground kind of situation. Um, I, I think patriotism is mostly a good thing, but I think this is a sort of blind patriotism. I, I don't think, I mean, the, the proper word is having a love and respect for, you know, it's from the word, you know, uh, the, you know, having having love and respect for the land of your fathers, sure. right? Uh, patriotism, it comes from, you know, like the same root as patriarchy and so on, right? It's the land of your father, you know, your ancestral background. Be careful, they're going to close your bank account too. Oh, oh is, that, is, that, is that not allowed now? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know what we can say and what we can't. Um, but, I, you know, and, and some of this is how I've grown up. I, I'm a kind of what people call a multicultural kid, born in the UK, family from Nigeria, grew up in Saudi Arabia, went to both American and British schools. So whilst I have love for the UK and love for Nigeria, I don't have this notion that like, I must stay in this one place my whole life. I've never stayed in any one place my whole life. I think you can love your country and see the pros and but, but isn't that the issue? It, but what's that? Isn't that the issue though? The issue is you've been in these different places yeah. and you're like, hey, they each other are pros and cons, mm -hmm. which goes to maybe I want to live in one place, have a business in another, meet my spouse and another, what have you. There's probably no one catch-all. Yeah. To me, and I'm probably a little less patriotic than you are, when you talk about the, <laughs> no, but when you talk about the parents, I say, why is it that people from my high school, a few people that I got, what I heard have died of like, opiate overdoses. We went to the same high school. Yeah. Why is it I became successful and some of them had, by the way, not trying to like, obviously very sad, yeah. but are we patriotic to the government into the school system, into like all the government institutions that certain people became successful. I would say it was my own determination. I would say it was my own family upbringing. To a certain extent, probably probably the fact that I didn't feel comfortable growing up where I grew up that like made me want to strive to accomplish something. To me, that's worth a lot more than a country. What did the country do? Mm. Um, now, you can say, hey, in Nigeria, there are places where people can't go to school. Okay, I'm not suggesting the alternative to the United States or Canada is to go to rural Nigeria. Mm -hmm. There's so many other places, and that, that's such a false narrative, but it's one that's used by the folks who haven't done what you or I ever done, where you've been in these different places, hey, this is workable. Yes. These people think if they went to Saudi Arabia, they'd get at the plane and they'd be shot in the head. Mm -hmm. and they really think that, and guess what? They have to think that, because it allows them to sit and do nothing about the problem. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people who even watch me they like the idea. It sounds fantastical. It's it's James Bond. Um, but am I going to really do anything? No. I think that there are certain people who watch what I talk about and, and diversifying internationally, that if Trump won in 2024, somehow all their problems would be solved. Mm -hmm. As if the entire United States would just fall in line because Trump, I mean, it's just not how it works. Right. Um, the culture of these countries in the West is changing. And I think that... Um, uh, it's always a hard thing to adapt to. I mean, look look throughout history, people who didn't realize, they didn't read the tea leaves and see yeah. what was going to change. Um, many of them were wiped out. I mean, look at right here, you know, in Montenegro. It wasn't that mm -hmm. long ago. There were some very big changes. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's an interesting idea because, you know, something I was, I have ra weird random thoughts all the time and something I was actually mulling over last week is what, when you think of a country, what does that actually mean to someone? When you think of a country, is that the, is that the physical landmass? Is it, the people? Is it the government and institutions? Is it some hybrid combination? Like when someone says, I love this country or I dislike that country, are they, what exactly is meant by that? So I think that's an interesting thing for each individual to kind of think about and work out. When someone says, I love the USA, I love Canada, I love the UK, do you mean the love for the people? Do you mean this, just this physical land, the geography? Um, cause a lot of the people who are hyper patriotic at the same time will also say that they don't like the government or they even hate it or they distrust it and they don't like the institutions and so on. Yet at the same time, if they hear this type of conversation, they may think that we are being unpatriotic because we're critical of these same institutions that they themselves are critical of. I don't think we're, we're not even in many cases here, you know, it's not even criticizing the land. It's not criticizing the land or criticizing the average person on the street. It's saying I, that I think, there's, I think there's a lot of mental gymnastics that people have to do yeah. uh, with all due respect, uh, which we all have to get over at some point. I mean, how, how do you get over a fear? How do you get over a frustration? You just you just dive in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had to do that. I wanted to travel. I wanted to see what the opportunities were. I, I see now how I, I, I 
a culture to, or a country to me is, is its culture. Mm. And this is why I think a country like the US or maybe Canada or Australia, number one, they're so isolated in, in some sense from the rest of the world. I mean, the UK is right at the door of Europe. Obviously, if you live in continental Europe, you've got all these different countries and cultures right around you. There's an awareness of that. But when you live in the US, Canada, Australia, you're kind of a little bit further from that, which is why maybe those people travel a little bit less. They're a little bit less aware of, of what's happening because it's not right at their door. Yeah. How is a culture of a country the size of any of those three going to be the same throughout? And then how is it going to never change? Mm -hmm. Whether you like it or not, the culture of the United States is changing. To me, that's what the country is. Um, borders change, mm -hmm. but, but you know, the issue is what do the people in this country stand for? And so you've got a lot of folks who are like, I'm patriotic to the United States, but I hate the government and they don't like the things that are changing. Well, that's what it is, mm -hmm. a set of lines. I mean, it doesn't really matter what's, in, what's within the lines, it matters you know, what the culture is. And so I think people, for whatever reason, there are folks on the left in the US, there are folks on the right who are saying like, I don't like what's coming to the Supreme Court. We've had a lot of these kind of more right-leaning you know, decisions, whether it's Roe v. Wade, affirmative action lately, that stuff being struck down. People on the left are saying, I don't feel comfortable with the institutions that we've put in place. On, on the right, obviously a lot of talk about woke and all the, you know, some of the you know, lack of privacy, the war on cash, what have you. To me, that's embedded in the culture at this point. Mm. You know, you've got a huge country and it's just barreling down the track. How do you change that? You know, you look at countries with 4 million people where they blew the thing up and started over. We talked about Georgia. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a lot easier than 330 million people. How are you going to blow that up and start over? Yeah. And yet, the idea of, oh, we'll secede. Do you really think the U.S. is letting any state in the U.S. secede? <laughs> I mean, is that really going to be a practical solution? No. Right? So I just, I, I, I think... From my perspective, there's a place that already represents the values that you have. Mm. Jim, we have, we have an annual event called Nomad Capitalist Life. Jim Rogers is speaking this year, and I love his saying, in 1800, if you were smart, you moved to London. That was the place to be. If you were talented, ambitious, you went to London. 1900, you go to New York. Mm -hmm. 2000, you go to Asia. He lives mm -hmm. in Singapore. He's got blonde-haired, blue-eyed daughters who speak flawless Mandarin, so he says. Times change. There's no empire that's remained constant throughout history. And I think that you're at a turning point for the West because for the longest time, there was no competition. Mm -hmm. Now there's competition and they don't like it. Yeah. And they're doing everything they can to make it harder to open a bank account overseas, make it harder to get a second passport uh, because they don't like the fact that there are options. But the reality is maybe some of those countries already speak to what you want mm -hmm. the way that your country spoke to it 50 or 100 years ago. Yeah. Our podcast today is sponsored by The Wellness Company. As you guys know, I'm always looking for the best health and wellness products to give me an edge. But if I eliminate businesses that have gone woke or forced vax mandates on their employees, there are fewer and fewer companies that I feel comfortable supporting. That's where The Wellness Company comes in. The Wellness Company was formed by a team of doctors who lost their jobs for speaking up about mandates and pushing back against lockdowns. They offer live telemedicine and a wide range of custom formulated supplements to help keep you at your best. My favorite wellness company product is their spike support formula. It's the only product I've seen that contains ingredients researched to block and dissolve COVID spike proteins in the bloodstream. Taking daily spike support can bring better mental clarity and increased energy levels. Whether you're vaxxed or unvaxxed, it doesn't discriminate and neither does the wellness company. Get back to that pre-COVID feeling. Go to twc.health forward slash Zuby and use code Zuby, that's Z-U-B-Y, to save 15% at checkout. That's twc.health forward slash Zuby and use the code Zuby at checkout. So one of the things that um, I'm really noticing, and I think that <laughs> it's, it's so funny because there's a whole month uh, celebrating it in many parts of the West, but pride, I think, is a massive problem because something I note with a lot of Western countries is there. If you if when you travel, if you go to parts of the Middle East, I mean, I just became a Dubai resident recently. If you're seeing the way Saudi Arabia is opening up and liberalizing in some ways, if you look at places like Qatar, I'd imagine some other places in the Far East, what they do is they actually look to the West and they cherry pick the best parts of it, right? They see what it was exactly, that made. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So so they look over. In, if you go to Dubai, Dubai itself does not really have any culture. What they do is they look all around the world and they take the best parts from each place whilst also maintaining some of their traditions and belief systems. 
But if I even say to most Americans or most Brits or whatever, hey, you look, there's some cool stuff happening in the Middle East or there or there. People don't even want to hear it. People don't they even have want an insult ready. Uh, yeah, like like people don't even want to be like, wait, okay, that's that's interesting. Um, okay, what are some things that you think they're doing better over there than we are doing over here? And it's a it's quite a, an increasingly long list. But it seems like at the governmental level and even at the citizen level, people just don't want to hear that. There's this pride because you're still running off the fumes of look, we've been the top dogs for the past few centuries and that's never going to change and we don't need you know it's the, i'm number one i'm number I'm, one so I'm, why I'm try a harder. great student of history it's never going to change it's very, <laughs> thank goodness i mean if you, you can move with the phoenicians i mean mm. no i mean no place is perfect sure but i think that some of those places in the gulf have done a really good job first of all if you look at the uae who are the ministers unlike in the uk where the ministers kind of get shuffled around like djs on a radio station okay now you're doing the now you're doing mornings on the alternative station like they just kind of slot them in it seems in the uk yeah. in the us i mean every two years Ma mayor pete is in charge of your roads and bridges i mean this this is the best you can find in the uae the ministers are like they've already succeeded in that field yeah it's not an example of those who, who can't do teach, those who can't do go into government. They've already done it personally. Like, oh, you're the minister of finance. Like you actually know finance from the real world. That's good. And what they've done is they've shattered this uh, thing that I hear, in all fairness, in many countries around the world. Well, that's just how we do it here, Yeah. right? That's not a response. I mean, I'm in business my entire life, my adult life. And I grew up around a business person. Um, I don't wanna hear how someone's trying their best. Um, I don't want to hear defeatism. Uh, I don't want to hear like, well, that's just how it goes. Um, and by the way, what I found in hiring, you know, some of these corporate managers is, well, that's just the best you can do. Mm. No entrepreneur wants to hear that's the best you can do. And so that very unentrepreneurial culture is present. And I think it's increasingly present in yeah. the West where it's just like, well, that's just how we do things. If you don't like it, like go home, go yeah. back to your country. Oh, it's like, what is it? To your point, I thought we were so open-minded these days, mm -hmm. like, you know, but you really can't suggest improvements. Meanwhile, yes, I think that in the Gulf and the UAE and those places, uh, it's like, hey, what's working over there? But let's not take the bad parts. Yes, exactly. I, I chose to live uh, part-time in Malaysia. I've been there off and on for 10 years. I've called it the United States of Asia, but in all the good ways. Mm. It's comfortable. It's kind of entry-level Asia to where it's not like a big cultural adjustment. I've been all around Asia. I appreciate that, but I like living part-time in a place where it's a little more homey. Yeah. It was you know, with the British influence, uh, speaks English. And I mean, somehow they've managed to have multiculturalism. Of course, they have some issues, but it, people are on each other's throats in the same way that they are in the US. And what I know is I haven't been back for six or seven years. It's even gotten worse. Um, it's gotten a lot worse in the last six or seven years in terms of polarization. I'm sure it has, yeah. So, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, a country like Malaysia, for example, or in the, the Gulf where they're like intentionally saying, yes, let's cherry pick because we're not going to have a dogma about that's our way of doing it. Yeah. I mean, it's just a, right. And, and again, if look at business. If you bring someone into your company, well, that's just how I do it. The person's gone immediately. Who wants that? You would never succeed. Mm. I mean, look at any innovation. But these countries aren't trying to innovate. Why? They use the dollar or they use their currency. They use their geopolitical might, which is waning slowly but surely. And they use the best branding. I mean, better than Coca-Cola, better than any company I've ever seen. They have the best branding mm -hmm. to make people think, don't go anywhere. And if you do go somewhere, they start, you know, making it more difficult for, mm -hmm. let's say, look at the Caribbean. Look at, look at where you're from in, in the UK. When all those countries in the Caribbean, Eastern Caribbean, got independence like in the late 70s, early 80s, what did they do? With the UK's blessing, hey, go into offshore banking. Yep. Make your money that way. You don't have our money anymore, so go into offshore banking. Then they came through and cracked down. No, we don't, you can't do that. People have too many options. Then they said, let's offer citizenship by investment. We do that for folks. Mm -hmm. I'm St. Lucian, right? Part of the Commonwealth. Then they're like, well, we don't really like that. Maybe you shouldn't be able to come to the UK without a visa because maybe you're like a Chinese war criminal or something. Or now they're doing, you have to get an interview. They're going to start doing interviews before you get it. Okay, not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But they really don't like the fact that there's competition. Countries that claim that they're the places that create competition in the free market don't like it within your ability to go to different countries. And yet mm -hmm. some countries are saying, yeah, let's cherry pick. Yeah. At the same time, though, I think that increasing numbers of people are waking up to this. So my entire life, I've been, you know, like I said, I, I lived in Saudi Arabia for 20 years. 
Um, it's quite an extraordinary and rare place to grow up. So you can imagine through the 90s, through the thousands, through the 2010s and whatever, I, I, I'm just getting people offline and online asking me crazy questions, having huge sweeping assumptions of, you know, a country they've never been to, a whole part of the world they've never been to, saying this, claiming that, whatever. So my entire life, I've been, uh, you know, quote unquote, defending Saudi Arabia in yeah. some ways, just to try to make it clear to people what it's actually like, like what it was actually like for me to grow up there, how safe it was, what it was like for my family, this and this, answering whatever questions, um, addressing whatever prejudices people have. Something I have noticed in the last few years, and perhaps this was accelerated by the massive crushing of civil liberties and freedom from 2020 to 2021, well, 2022 really, um, in the name of the uh, pandemic, let's call it. Um, I think that did wake millions of people up. It at least caused people to question a lot of the assumptions and beliefs they'd always have, right? Because if you're in a country like the US, Canada, UK, Australia, any Western European country, places that are supposed to be bastions of civil liberty and human rights and freedom and so on, and they're saying, hey, you can't go outside. Hey, you've got to cover your face. Hey, you've got to do this. Hey, you can't see your friends. You can't see your family. You've got to do all this. And you're saying it's all in the name of safety. Whatever it's in the name of, it massively, it, for me, in fact, it, it completely and utterly destroyed the veil of human rights and civil liberties being the bastions of these nations. Because if as soon as there's a, a crisis or some kind of emergency or people are afraid or the government just says so, and you can't leave your house and you can't see your friends can't and you can't do anything, either, you can't get out the country. I'm like, that's, that's North Korea level stuff. Like that is, and people might, oh, well, it's temporary it's or it's just, it's different. And I'm like, well, it's, it's not. It's, it's like the freedom of speech thing, right? If it's like, okay, you've got freedom of speech until you say something that offends someone or what, I'm like, well, you don't have freedom of, it's no not one's ever, Hey, good morning, morning Subi. It's great to see yeah. you. Like, no one's ever outlined that. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, but, uh, well, you couldn't leave your country in Australia. You couldn't crazy. come back to your country. What's the point of citizenship? It's worthless. Yes. And so we have the nomad passport index every year. I guess we took Australia down some notches on freedom. But the reason why they say it's different is because that's the, it's, it's, that's the same answer as if you don't like it the way we do it, go somewhere else. Or that's just the way we do it. Couldn't even go somewhere. <laughs> well, that's true. That's, that's why having multiple passports, yeah. residence, et cetera, helped me. I did very well during that time. But, um, it, it's it's the only response they have because they can't confront. And by the way, I'm ta I take on both sides on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's people who say the mainstream media is out of control, and then but they still get the mainstream media's opinion on Saudi Arabia and say it's bad. Yes. Uh, I, I just think there's a lot of mental gymnastics defending people's countries. And by the way, you know, I left the U.S. I won't go back. I am totally really out of that system. Gave up the citizenship. So I'm not saying people have to go that extreme. But to say, I'm going to open a bank account somewhere else, mm -hmm. or I'm going to get residence in Dubai and I'm going to pop in one or two days a year to keep that active, just as a backup plan. Yeah. Maybe I buy a property there. Maybe I put a company there. Maybe the company doesn't save me taxes because I'm running it from a place where they still have taxes. If I run my Dubai company in the US, I'm not saving taxes. It's just Dubai is potentially zero and the US charges me whatever they would charge me. But maybe it's just... I'm one step closer to being more diversified. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's easier to work with my guy. Who knows? But you don't have to go to the extremes, but you should realize, even if that stuff didn't happen the last couple of years, how is it that your country is the best in everything? <laughs> That's pretty serendipitous, don't you think? Mm -hmm. All right, fine. Forget like Niger and like, you know, the Central African Republic and like, all right, there's a few you want to pick. Fine, you can, you have those. But really, you don't think that like, I mean, uh, again, bet, you know, if you're in Bitcoin, best place to mine Bitcoin. Uh, you know, Georgia, for example, is one of the places for that. Now the government's going to get into doing it. Isn't that kind of innovation what you what you'd like to have if you're an entrepreneur or if you're trying to do things innovatively? I mean, uh, so I, I I think that the veneer has been stripped off. Uh, we've had a lot of people who contacted us over the last couple of years and said, "I've enjoyed watching your stuff. It was entertaining to watch what you're doing. Now I really think I need this." Yes. Here's the challenge, though. Canada, you mentioned Canada. We had folks who came and said, I need to get a plan, I need to get a plan. Help me make a plan. We make the plan, and a number of weeks later, suddenly it's like, all right, it seems a little better now. Yes. Or, you know, the stuff you talk about a couple of years, okay, it seems better now. Yes. It's like, okay, hold on a second. When in the course 
of a downward trajectory of a government has a momentary spike up ever stopped the trend. The trend is you have fewer and fewer freedoms. You can go back to 9-11. Mm -hmm. You can go back to before that. Mm -hmm. But this century in the West, you've had fewer and fewer and fewer freedoms, more of the government telling you what to do. Shut up. You'll do what we ask. Less and less of for the people. How is that going to change? Just because like th that'll be the next thing. Yeah. And I think that that's the difference between folks who are maybe from, you know, who have the, who are from Nigeria or from, I don't know about Saudi Arabia, but like from a lot of these emerging countries here in Montenegro, they're like, we've seen what can happen, mm -hmm. right? And so when you've seen it and when you realize, hey, my country's not perfect, you realize you need this stuff. Whereas I think Westerners are, they're waking up, but I'm not sure they're entirely there yet to, this is going to be, this is the new, this is how it works now. Yeah. It's, it's comfort. And you know, comfort can be yes. a cage. The, the two things I always notice that people say are, number one, actually there's three. Number one is, that can't happen here. Right? Why not? So if you talk about former Yugoslavia, if you talk about the Soviet Union, if you talk about what happened in Germany in the past century, even if you just look at the past century and you see the amount of uh, totalitarianism that occurred and the amount of genocide that occurred, people like to think, no, like that, that's just history. That that can't happen here. Number two, which is similar, is it won't go that far, right? So they start freezing people's bank accounts, they start banning people, they start censoring people, passing new bills that are just ridiculous, and people think, uh, no, I won't. it won't get there, right? There's things that are happening right now, which in 2017, people said, like, come on, man, like that's Or the Constitution will happen. stop them, as if they pay attention to that. Yeah. Um, and then the last one as well, and you, I'm sure you hear this, despite the fact every, everything you talk about and how clear you are with it. The other one I get all the time is, well, there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> um, and that one is, is, is quite crazy because there's about 200 countries in the world and people will literally say, well, there's nowhere else to go or it's the same 252 anyway. countries and jurisdictions. If you look at the Cayman Islands, okay, self-autonomy, yeah. that kind of, 196 countries, but 252 when it's like self-governing territories. Uh, yeah, put out something recently on CBDCs. Uh, I see, I don't trust the government on that. Mm -hmm. I'm probably not quite as stream, extreme as some people are. Um, but I said, you know, I think there's always gonna be somewhere to go. And I saw one person said, oh, so your suggestion is to go to a third world country. I said, well, first of all, look at the United States. Mm -hmm. you, it used to be one person went to work, you lived in a nice house, you had a couple cars, you went to the movies. It's not that easy anymore. No. Why? I guess because I'm a very, very tiny part of this. I don't hire people in the US. They make it unfriendly for me to do so. Mm -hmm. So I hire internationally. We save money. Um, we get better people. We can promote them faster. So where they're like some of the top earners in their country, but still cheaper than the West because they have lower cost of living. And a lot of people have done that. So, I mean, once we have no borders with the internet, wh why do we need to have borders for anything, right? I, I get that like it was only supposed to benefit us. There was never supposed to be any negative consequences. But I happen to think that there's people all around the world who are more driven, more intelligent, more worldly, that for a worldly business like mine are more suited to serving the people that we help than someone who lives in a country where it's just rah, rah, USA. Why wouldn't I hire those people? Why should, because I'm from one country, I have an obligation to support only those people because they were lucky enough to be born within the borders. Mm -hmm. I was born pretty close to Canada. Why don't I support Canadians? So, I mean, I would, you know. Okay, well, I'm curious to know, what, what do you think is the trajectory of, say, the United States, and I guess you can include it in this or you can separate them, other Western countries. Let's say over the next century, over yeah. the next hundred years, where do you think the world is going? The, the past century has been crazy. If you look at everything that's happened from 1923 to 2023, all across the world, it's, it's been insane. Where do, you think, where do you think we're going in the next century? I think that if you follow the stuff that we talk about, it's a little bit easier than having to read the tea leaves because mm -hmm. who exactly knows? Now, what we do know is you're going to have kind of the emergence of other either superpowers or mini superpowers, you know, niche superpowers. When people say, where's the next Singapore? I said, there'll, there'll be a lot of niche Singapores. There's so many countries in competition now, right? And again, there's 252 countries you can go to. So your, your earlier point of there's nowhere to go, yeah. they're all going to have different positions. If you look at the war, whatever your opinion on it, Russia and Ukraine, 
the number of countries that are very pro-Ukraine, 30, mm -hmm. 40 countries. And some of those are very small population countries. So the, the percentage of the world whose country is very much pro-Ukraine, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not, you know, I've, I've talked about how we helped Ukrainians, mm -hmm. you know, have a place to live when, when they were escaping. Um, but there's other countries that are, some of them very, very, very pro-Russia. I sat next to an Indian guy. He's like, I hope Russia crushes them. Mm. You think that he's not going to give you a different position, that that country is not going to give you a different position? So I, I don't know what's going to happen exactly. I think that, for example, if you think there's going to be, you know, chaos, wars, famines, what have you, having a residence in a South American country is a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. I have residence in Colombia. It's not a place I spent a lot of time. But during 2021, when Asia was less hospitable, um, when Europe was somewhat less hospitable, I spent a bunch of time in my house in Colombia. And I really kind of enjoyed that. And I saw the potential. Obviously, a lot of agricultural land. The currency is weaker. There's a lot of deals to be had in that part of the world. I think Ecuador may be going a little bit in the wrong direction since I was there. But you can buy land for, for pennies, mm. and you're totally self-sufficient. I'm not like a prepper. I like living in a city. But, you know, having some land where you could grow some food in different parts of the world that you pick up for just a little little bit of money. I bought land in Georgia for $1,000. You can grow potatoes. You can grow vegetables. Wouldn't be the worst thing to have. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you're going to have more kind of regional factions. You look at Brazil and Argentina, let's have a currency. You look at the BRICS, let's have a currency. Other countries want to join BRICS. You have the new development bank. These are all saying, we don't want to be in the dollar system. We don't want to have to deal with the U.S. 29% of the world is sanctioned now by the United States. 29% of the I world is sanctioned, that. up from eight at the turn of the century. Mm. It just shows how indiscriminate it's becoming. You think those countries aren't going to push back? So my big prediction is you're going to see countries that want to rise, that in some cases have big populations, like in Indonesia, Nigeria, Brazil, India, of course. You're also going to see smaller players that just say, hey, we see an opportunity to get on board with a new innovation. So Malta, Bermuda, Georgia, what have you. Let's be in crypto. Let's be in blockchain. Let's be in this. Let's be the AI leader. You know, the U.S. can't get behind what they want to do. So you're going to have big players. They're going to say, let's rise to the top. They're going to demand to be taken seriously. And enough of this sanction stuff and enough of like shoving us down. They're going to do their own thing. Yes. So you're going to see smaller niche players. They're going to have the opportunity to pick where they want to go. Malaysia was always very pro-US. Then they woke up one day and said, wait a second, are we getting anything out of this? Right? America first, right? That was the big Trump thing. Okay, they're saying Malaysia first. We get nothing from being associated with you. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should talk to China. Will China give us something? Right? Because they're thinking Malaysia first. Yes. If you're saying, Andrew, why, is, why don't you like America first? That's how it should be. Well, shouldn't it be every country first for themselves? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. They don't think that. No, no, no. Malaysia should just do our bidding. Mm -hmm. Shut up. Who cares? Don't become rich. Let us keep our jobs and be fat and happy. You guys should just eat your little bowl of rice. No, no, no. I, I, I'm saying it should be the opposite. And it's becoming the opposite. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I think you're going to see all these emerging powers are going to have to be taken seriously. And look at when we were kids 20 years ago, the Chinese, were, we were watching news, they were riding their bicycles around. Yeah. What do you think happens in another 20 years, in another 40 years? Maybe not in China. They have a demographics problem. Mm -hmm. India, Indonesia, mm -hmm. that's the one no one talks about. They're not going to just go along with this Western system. And if you're looking for a place that more matches your culture, maybe there's a place that will. Yeah. Financially, everything. Yeah. One of my greatest predictors of, of over the next century, and I'm, I'm not the only one to, to, to think this, but I think that every single city, state, and nation is going to have to compete for the best people, Absolutely. for the most competent people, for investment, for resources. I mean, most of human history, the people have been very landlocked, right? Like it, the idea that you can just get on a plane and just go to Montenegro, go to Dubai, go to the States, go here, go there. The idea that you can remote work. I mean, what the heck was remote working 30 years ago, right? The idea that you can just have a laptop and be traveling around the world and still be getting work done and still be communicating in real time with people doing it's open calls, to everybody now. That. It's open to everybody. There's no more excuse that you live in the U.S. and you exactly. can't be rich. Yes, because I got Moroccans who are 25 making millions. <laughs> it's awesome. That's what that's what I mean, right? So, and those people are going to want to be where it makes most sense, right? If Morocco is good for them, they'll stay in Morocco. If hey, it makes more sense for them to go to Bali, they can go to Bali, whatever. And that is 
that's brand new. And you're even seeing within the USA, you're seeing a lot of migration going on. You're seeing massive waves of people moving from California to Utah, to Nevada, to Texas. People from New York are moving down south to Florida and other places. So this is already happening. I think when a lot of times when people think of voting, everyone thinks of, you know, the, the ballot box. We'll get them at the ballot box, get them at the ballot box. The most no, important, you won't. You won't. <laughs> the most important, same people, by the way, don't believe elections. I think they're all rigged anyway, but, right. um, the biggest, I think the most impactful forms of voting are voting with your feet and voting with your wallet, right? If California's population is decreasing for the first time in history and they're losing billions in tax revenue and whatever, because people are literally just leaving these cities, leaving that state and going where they are treated better, maybe not best, but going where they're treated better, that's just going to accelerate, right? And at the same time, they're running themselves into the ground because they're making these ridiculous policies or they're raising taxes. We're losing people. Let's raise taxes even higher. And so you're just, you're just driving out the most lucrative, the most competitive, the most competent, the highest earning people. You're driving out all that investment and it's going to go, it's going to go elsewhere. And I think there will be some probably some attempts at exit taxes and other oh, things to make it harder. That is how they are going to respond. Yeah. California, you can't keep up with all the new taxes they're proposing. Yeah. It won't work though. Not long well, term. I mean, they're saying if you, I mean, they, they tried and I guess failed temporarily. Uh, if you've been here for 60 days in the last 10 years, I mean, it's just, it's just <laughs> incredible because, because it's desperate. Yes. D does, does a country that's on the upswing need to do that? No. Right. Um, so they don't like the competition, but there will be more competition. Uh, and so, you know, very simply, people are going to have a choice. Um, you can choose on taxes. Mm -hmm. You can choose on lifestyle. You can choose on weather. But here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Other countries have beaches. Yes. Other places have beaches. Now, if I told you that in the United States, I saw this statistic recently from one of our immigration attorneys. Indians, okay, there's a lot of Indians trying to go to the U.S. When do you think there's a certain class of family reunification where the Indians are going in to the embassy this month to apply for their residence permit. Guess when they applied for that residence permit for that particular class of Indian citizens looking for family reunification? 10 years ago. So you you're, you know better than anybody else. March of 1998. Yeah. So how are you talking about bringing the best and brightest when for some people it takes 25 years for the, some of them are probably dead. Yeah, for sure. Right? I, uh, I go to, you know, to Ireland, for example. Because I said, all right, I want to have one country in the mix where we can just talk like this mm -hmm. with everybody. What yes. if I want to go out and enjoy? It was like a month. And they were the most pleasant. There's like a little mistake. Oh, we're very sorry. Okay, we'll fix it. Now, you lived in the UK. I, I would, you know, do I think the UK is the great panacea? No. Would it be a place where I would spend some time to maybe build some context, what have you? Perhaps. That's why people are staying in the U.S., by the way. Oh, that's where all the people are. So you can apply that to any English-speaking country. The U.K., right before the war, canceled the investor visa program. Now, there's still lots of people immigrating to the U.K., just not people like me who would invest two million pounds. Now, that's fine, but I'm not sure how that's, I mean, how does that work long term? How are you going to build the next generation of talent? And they're not worried about that because, number one, they figure they'll just shame you, tax you manipulate you, you know, market to you, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then they figure, hey, you know, whatever, it'll figure itself out. We're the name brand. Mm -hmm. I don't, th no one succeeds in business. I mean, what's Andy Grove? Only the paranoid survive. These countries aren't paranoid enough. They just think they'll always be around. And Gavin Newsom in California thinks that because he has good beaches, that you have the same weathers in California and parts of Portugal, parts of Mexico, parts of Chile, parts of Greece. Um, guess what you have in all those countries? Incredible tax friendliness for many people. Lower cost of living. In some cases, over the last year, lower inflation. Mm -hmm. And yeah, voting where you're, with your feet is the only way to solve it. More safety even in many cases. More safe than California, sure. So it's the same thing as, you know, if you have a problem in a business, you might make a complaint once. But, you know, eventually you're just going to realize, you know, if, I, if I've got a problem with an airline, for yeah. example, they don't care. They give, will you take our survey? No, I'm not taking your survey. <laughs> because you don't care what I think, right? You don't care. And if I don't like the airline enough, I'll fly a different airline. Yep. This idea of, that's what voting is. Mm -hmm. It's sitting around yelling at like the airline company, like, you know, you're not listening to me. But things are going in one direction. I'm a big believer in momentum. 
And the momentum in Western countries, I was reading about it at 12 years old. U.S. was one of the top economies. It got as low as like 21, freest economy. Mm -hmm. Okay, out of 190, that's still not at the bottom by any means. But there were post-communist countries that were communist in your lifetime beating it. Yes. What does that say about how things change? Yeah. Oh, there's in count or in Dubai, they say, but they have oil. Listen, do I care why I'm not paying any tax? <laughs> I don't really care. Right? Yeah. Oh, by the way, you have oil in the US. Yep. You don't use it and you waste a bunch of money fighting wars. Listen, I'm just looking for the best deal for me. Yes. This is the other thing I hate about like when you go into a business, they're like, oh no, 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 you don't understand. I was at a hotel recently. And I said, Oh, hey, can you help me get a taxi? I was at your bar. It's not our bar. Like they lease it out to some other oh, independent okay. operator or something. It's like, I'm a business guy. I can't tell the difference. You think the average person knows like, oh, you list that out to chef whoever that like he's running the bar. I just want to get a taxi and they get immediately kind of defensive. Mm. And it's just like the same thing of like, I don't want to know how your business, I don't want to hear your business's problems. You don't want to know my business problems. I don't want to know your business's problems. And these, and, and, and so it's the same thing of like, I don't really care how sausage is made that the UAE gets it down to zero, mm -hmm. right? Uh, maybe other countries should use their resources better rather than shaming the UAE or some other Gulf country for yeah. not having the, high taxes. The oil thing is funny because there are so many countries that have more oil yes. than, <laughs> than these. Isn't the, aren't they, don't quote me on this, aren't the highest reserves of oil in, um, isn't it Venezuela? What? I think it's the U.S. and Venezuela. I, 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 think, I think Venezuela. I believe Venezuela has the most oil reserves of any nation in the world. I mean, Russia's up there. But yeah. So the idea that just having oil is the sort of be all and end all when you can see what's going on in some places that have huge amounts of oil. It's also about culture, by the way. You look at a country like Malaysia, when everyone in the U.S. was complaining about gas prices. I walked around. I was taking pictures in, in Kuala Lumpur. Um, and that's why I wanted to have the event uh, there this year was... It was less than half the price mm -hmm. because they actually use their oil to benefit their own people. How dare they? Yeah. Uh, obviously, in, the, in parts of the Gulf, they do that as well. Yeah. But uh, in Malaysia, it was, I mean, it was 60% cheaper, I think, mm -hmm. because it's used properly. Uh, I'm not saying that any government is, you know, is super duper uh, efficient, but I think it comes down to priorities. I mean, the United States, where I'm from, which is the one I can speak the most about, you're basically just there to ensure they can pay back the debt. Does anyone really believe there's any kind of like individual, like, hey, we care about this guy? No. And that's the challenge of having this kind of huge empire and being a citizen of that huge empire. I mean, you're really just kind of a, um, you know, cattle, as Doug Casey would say, um, that just kind of offered up to, you know, benefit the interests of the country. And if you live in smaller countries where there's more of the thought that goes into it, we have to serve our citizens. Uh, I think that's a much better situation for people. Yeah. So one of my... Uh... One of my followers on Twitter actually wrote something really interesting in response to a post because a couple weeks ago, I just had a photo of me uh, in the on the Palm Jumeirah in Dubai. And I just said, you know, I, I just just became a UAE resident. Um, and I wrote something like after traveling the world, going to a lot of places, it just it just made the most sense. Mm. And it got hundreds and hundreds of comments. And um, one of my American friends commented, um, you know, he, he wrote something like 20 years ago. A guy like Zuby would have 100% emigrated to the USA, and now we've lost him. Yeah. And that's that was quite actually uh, quite an insightful and interesting comment there, because I was thinking of that, and I was like, yeah, I mean, 20 years ago it was not necessarily a no-brainer, but if I were thinking of where to go, I mean, it, USA would it was it was it was the place, right? It was, Certainly, when it was I was the born, place. when we were born in the, yeah. in the mid '80s, it was the number one place to yeah. be born. Yeah, it, it wasn't you know the idea that. You've got the option. You could immigrate to the United Arab Emirates or the United States of America, and someone's like, but "That's my point." Uh, it yeah, was kind of. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like, what was number two when I was born? I think it was West Germany. Mm. Like, the there just weren't as many options. Yes. I mean, just look. By the way, look at what happens too. We mentioned the mainstream media. Look at how everything from the nightly news to the, the nighttime talk shows. The numbers are going down. I mean, yeah. Fox News actually had. I guess they're moving him now. They had the number one nighttime talk show, not Johnny Carson, that, that air is gone. Yep. It's Greg Gutfeld on Fox News doing a political show. He beats them all. And now even Fox News is in the issue. Now it's it's so niched down. There's so many options. That's happening in everything. Yes. The playing field has been democratized. You want to start an online business? It doesn't matter where you are. Um, 
you, you, you know, all this stuff has been opened up to you. Mm-hmm. There's finally some options. I mean, go to the Dubai airport. They have the pictures of it. Here was the Dubai airport in like 1986, I think, right? It's like they're, they're dusting it off with like a broom. <laughs> shoo, get, shooing the camels away so the plane can land. I mean, maybe that was the 70s. I don't know. But it wasn't that long ago. I met a guy who has lived there for 41 years. He's, he's from the UAE. And he said that um, as recently as the, as the late 80s, he said going from Dubai to Abu Dhabi, just the next door emirate, he said it was a two-day trip by camel. So it's in, it's in our own lifetime that that trip has gone from being a two-hour journey by camel and no one having air conditioning to being what it is now. So that just shows how quickly places can develop. I, I look at this and I say, you, could, you can see it two ways. I see it and you see it as what a beautiful thing that people around the world have a chance in their own countries and their own cultures to become part of this global revolution and to be competitive and to choose where they want to compete and win. Other people look at it as how dare, I mean, and I've mentioned this many times, Trump's advisor, Steve Bannon said kind of begrudgingly, we emptied out our middle class and built one in Asia. And I really took that. I know he lived mm, in China. That's a great line. I took that to, 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 to say, why shouldn't Asia have a middle class? Mm-hmm. Now, if you're on Team USA and all you care about is succeeding, it doesn't matter what happens to anybody else, fine. I like to say competition's a good thing. I want as many players as possible. And so to me, the, the patriotism we talked about earlier, it really, it hurts you. Because then, as we've seen, they can do whatever they want. Yes. But at the same time that's been happening, we've had this great revolution. Um, and, and I think that to the point where people say there's nowhere else to go, they're still stuck in a news cycle where what they see is the U.S., Canada, Australia, it's all the Western countries. And countries. How often do you turn on the news in any Western country and you see, here's what they're doing in Indonesia. Here's the miracle that's happened. Jim Rogers talked about this. Whether you like the country or not, here's the miracle that's happened in Turkey, building manufacturing. You're here in Montenegro. A lot of the building materials, a lot of the supplies, you will get. If you don't want Chinese stuff, if you want a little bit higher quality, but you don't want fancy Italian stuff, you will buy Turkish materials. They've made a big push. You wouldn't know that and how, yes, they have you know, some economic issues, but you wouldn't know how more important that country has been. You wouldn't know how important Brazil has been or any of these places. You hear maybe a little bit about, okay, China's going into Africa, but you don't yeah. really know what that means. Yeah. And so if you're saying there's nowhere to go, uh, I can just tell you that culturally speaking, there's places where I go in Eastern Europe and Asia in particular, where it's not going to be the same as what you're dealing with now, I promise you. Yeah. You know, the patriotism idea is really interesting because to me, I think true prop- proper patriotism is more humble than it is prideful. I think it's, look, I'm from the US, let's say. I'm from the UK. I want my nation to be as uh, as good, as powerful, as competitive, as safe, as as good schools as possible, as healthy as possible, whatever. Not just the I'm number one, so I try harder mentality. It should be like, oh, okay, I I recognize what these people are, what these guys are saying about there being other options, right? We need to, we need to level up. We need to step it up. Like if you love your country, you should want it to level up. You shouldn't just be attacking anyone who is saying, hey, like some places are doing things better. I mean, the USA, I don't believe, I mean, again, don't quote me on this. I don't think it's in the top 20, maybe not even top 30 in terms of education, right? I think they, like just, that, they, just, they, just, they just had a new 30-year low in some of yeah. the, uh, in some of the, uh, the yeah. you know, 40 so, countries on math. Okay, yes. They're lower than ever. Yeah, I mean, so, so that but, but, should... But, 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 I, I hate the, because I state that fact uh-huh. that's inconvenient. I hate, I hate the United States. But, but, but I'm this, just showing the fact. But, see, this, this is why I bring up pride versus humility. Yeah. Because if, if you have this false sense of pride and, you know, kind of blind patriotism, you hear that and you recoil and you want to go, no, we're number one, we're number one, we're number one. Whereas you should go, man, that's a shame. Like, we're supposed to be But by the way, if you the went to Nigeria here, and said, hey... Don't we have the number one passport here in Nigeria? They'd be like, dude, our passport, our passport sucks. <laughs> right? They'd Absolutely. be like, listen, I'm proud to be Nigerian. Yes. I love our country. Yes. I love our people. I love our food. But I realize we got a lot of problems. Exactly. Yeah. And why shouldn't it be the, it's it not should be that everywhere? Oh, you know, we have so much, we're so much more sophisticated. Yeah. By the way, even on the simple things, how many times do we have to hear about the Texas electrical grid? People are like living in freezing in Texas, by the way. I thought it wasn't like so cold in Texas. I mean, they can't even get the power. You see bridges crumbling. And I think that we have this thing where it's like, I mean, 
had a guy, he was going to an event in, uh, in Bogota, where I, I have a home. And he says, if you come to this event in Bogota and you get robbed, you'll blame Bogota. Mm -hmm. If you got robbed where you live in, you know, Memphis, Tennessee, you would blame the person. Mm -hmm. And that's how people are approaching it, mm -hmm. uh, is that somehow the other is different and you blame that place. And listen, there are, there are certain places, just I'm not saying every emerging place is a place to go. Yes. Some of them, yeah, they don't want to improve. Now, by the way, maybe that's a great lifestyle. I don't think that people in Italy or Spain are too keen on like, let's get things going. We got to make some money around here. But you can live in Italy. They've got some tax incentives. You can pay 100,000 euros. If you're like a millionaire, mm -hmm. you can pay 100,000 euros a year to live in Italy. That's all you pay. Yeah. So if you make 10 million, you pay like 1% tax. And if you're like, hey man, I got my team working. I'm just going to chill. I want, I want to kind of finally kick back and relax. There's value in that. But it's all about, you know, choosing the right places for each part. I, I'm not I'm not moving all my money to Italian banks, but maybe I want to live on Lake Como. Yeah. So I just there's something to choose from every place. And I think that's a beautiful thing. What would you what would you recommend for the for the average person, right? Because a lot of people will hear this conversation or they'll hear a lot of things you're saying, I'm saying. They'll agree with some of it, disagree with some of it, but they'll kind of shrug their shoulders and be like, okay, well, you know. You guys have a lot of money. You can you can do this. Like, what about the what about the average Joe? What about the average Jane? What should they do? Well, first of all, when I have twenty four year old clients from Morocco who have multi million dollar incomes, I say first step is don't be a defeatist that you don't have a lot of money. Um, you can go out and create you know wealth for yourself. So that's the first thing is challenging that misconception. Let's talk about the strategies that I would suggest to give yourself some, at least some optionality. Yes. I chose to say, I want to be in the optionality, but if you just want to stay in your country, you're not ready yet, maybe you'll never leave, have the optionality. You want to open a bank account somewhere. There are countries from Georgia to Azerbaijan to Ecuador, maybe Cambodia, I mean, maybe here in Montenegro if you were to get a residence permit, whatever. But there's a few of like that, you can put in as little as zero dollars to have your bank account. You're not going to get, you know, top flight, you know, service. Um, but it's not going to be bad. You can hold multiple currencies. You get higher interest rates. If you're in the, if the U.S. in particular, you may need to report that account. But zero dollars, you've got an account with a debit card potentially. And now you've got a place where you can tunnel money either now or in the future if you wanted. You want to get a second citizenship to make sure that you're not just, you know, stuck with one passport, one country. Check your family tree, right? A lot of people, whether they're from, uh, ancestors from Europe, from the Caribbean, from Latin America, those are the big ones to look at. Um, you can go back one, two, three, even four generations and get a passport. You know, we do a premium service, maybe ten or twelve thousand dollars. But if you want to just do it yourself, it might be a little bit of a slog, or it might not. Um, you can do that. Get a residence permit in Latin America. Most countries, income is determined by, uh, uh, or sorry, residence is determined by income. Okay. So hey, I have twelve hundred dollars a month. I have two thousand dollars a month. I have you know whatever. It's generally not more. I think maybe one is like 3000 a month, like Uruguay might be or something. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you can get residents from Mexico all the way down to Argentina by showing you have income. They may occasionally say we want it to be more of a pension, like passive income. But generally speaking, you can use income from a kind of a job or anything like that. Get a residence permit. And what I would call a paper residence is you don't have to live there. Mm -hmm. Most of those countries, you may not be able to get citizenship without living there and learning the language. But you can oftentimes keep the residence permit active. Not all, but in many of those Latin American countries, you have income, right? And so your income from just a normal job, if they'll accept that, is probably enough. Mm -hmm. You can keep the residence permit active. Maybe you need to go there once a year and check in, which is a good thing to kind of get familiar. It's not that expensive to fly to Ecuador once a year or Mexico. I mean, people are doing that. So have that residence permit. And then you've got a place where you're higher than a tourist. During Colombia, there was a or during the, the pandemic, there was a time when in Colombia, as a citizen or permanent resident, which I am, you did not have to go through a whole bunch of restrictions to get mm -hmm. in, right? So I'm not a citizen, but I'm a permanent resident. And so that could be a benefit. So those are like three things you could do right now. You could also look at, you know, diversifying into other stocks. If you have a brokerage account that allows you to invest offshore, mm -hmm. um, you know, look at stocks in Europe. European banks pay much higher dividends than U.S. banks. Asian banks pay higher dividends than U.S. banks. Um, and then just travel, go and just shatter these myths and you'll see the opportunity. So those are a few things that people could do. Flights are not that expensive. And I'll tell you what, by the way, here's something else you should do. I got, I spent $301 on a medical check at Prince Court Hospital in Kuala Lumpur. Mm -hmm. I've never had any doctor 
who they're all trained in the UK. They, they don't, if, you don't, if you don't train and work in the UK, you can't work in this hospital. Mm. I've never gotten more attention from a doctor in my life. They go through an entire scan of everything going on with you. Then the doctor reviews it. They answer all your questions. They do a physical. It's pretty intense. Mm. And someone said that would cost you 10 grand in the US. Yeah. Take up things like that. $301. And by the way, it's exactly what we're talking about for, for the efficiency. I go in at 9.30, by 9.32, okay, let's go. They're rushing into the front of every queue. Okay, in and out, in and out, in and out. Radiology, two minutes. Okay, boop, boop, done. Right, next thing, let's go. You're done by 12.30, they give you lunch. You come back at 3.30, you talk to the doctor, you're out by four. You don't have that efficiency anywhere else. It's mm. 300 bucks. So that's one reason why I like Kuala Lumpur. Um, Bangkok has similar stuff. Um, but take advantage of what can I do? I mean, people go in their countries and get dental care, whether it's Mexico, whether it's Romania, Europe, Serbia. Um, you know, save some money and see how it's actually better in some cases. I mean, you go to the emergency room in the U.S., it's two grand, and they're like rushing you out. Yes. Um, so that's something that you can do as well. And you'll save money. I mean, the flight to, we, we flew someone from, from, from L.A. to Malaysia once, and it was like $600 return mm -hmm. by booking in advance. Yeah. I mean, you're going to make money on that deal. So flights aren't that expensive. Yeah. For, any, for anyone who hasn't traveled, and I, I often say the people who, the people who need to travel the most are the people with the greatest barriers to wanting to do so. The people who absolutely think that they do not need to ever leave their country and never should, I think those are the people who it would most benefit to. I'm not saying, look, you need to go to every country in the world, but even just to go to another one that's nearby, wherever you go, I think it's impossible to travel and to experience a place, experience a people, and not have your perspective widened at least a little bit. Um, I think you'll also maybe see, what travel also does, it'll create friction where you'll see other people's issues and you'll see your own issues, yes. by the way. I can tell you, working with teams from all over the world, mm -hmm. it creates a friction where maybe you would tolerate certain stuff in your country, but it really opens up your horizons to learn about people and practices and how things operate. Uh, and yes, don't be from the US and go to Canada. <laughs> if you're in Australia, <laughs> at least go to like Vanuatu or something. Yeah. or come up to Kuala Lumpur, it's eight hours away. If you're in the US, at least go to Mexico. Uh, I love, you know, our friend Mark Moss, for example, is talking about surfing in El Salvador. Nicaragua is a place, I keep seeing, obviously they have some problems, but I keep seeing Nicaragua, like their quality of life, lifespan, like everything keeps going, air pollution, like everything's going in the right, many things are going up in the right direction. Mm. People who can live there, you can get a residence permit in Nicaragua if you make a thousand dollars a month, something yes. like that. And is that the absolute best place to live? I don't know, but during the pandemic, they were more open and people were saying, okay, good taxes. Uh, if I make my money outside of Nicaragua, it's open. You know, I can get stuff very affordably. That's interesting to me. Um, so I really think people need to see those kind of countries you never see in the news because those are the ones that are emerging. Those are the ones that are going to offer opportunities. I'm not saying every single one of them. Um, but you know, I've, I've spent 10 years mostly in those countries. Again, there's a time when you're like, all right, can I just sit down at a restaurant and joke with the waiter? Mm -hmm. You miss that after a certain point. But if the goal was building a list of options of places you could go, I'm looking for places that are off the radar. Yes. If I can get Italian citizenship because my great grandfather was, was Italian, I'll take that. Mm -hmm. And that's a great compliment. And now if I'm American, I ever don't want to be American or I ever can't be American, fine. I'm still at the same high level of being able to travel in the world. But that to me isn't really the ultimate diversification. I'm looking at places that you haven't thought about because yeah. those are the ones that you need to, to go to. And by the way, we had a, a dinner for some clients a year ago in Serbia. They're, they're, they were like amazed. Like I never would have expected it to be like this. They come to join. They're you will be amazed in some of these places, but you have to not go to the ones that you keep thinking about. Yes. Awesome, man. So speaking of Kale, you've got your event Nomad Capitals Live, which is coming up in September. I'm going to be speaking at that as well. Can you tell people a little bit more about it? So we've had, well, I've, I've traveled the world for 15 years and I figured out where these opportunities are. We've had it as a blog, a YouTube channel, would have it for about 10 years, and we've served clients now for about seven and a half years. And so we've done a lot of the work of what are these strategies? We don't necessarily talk about all of it publicly, but this event is designed for people who want to learn about where to bank, where to get residence, where to get citizenship, including many of the options you haven't heard about, mm -hmm. including some of the stuff we don't talk about publicly just because people would kind of find it boring. Like, I don't want to hear about Honduras. Mm -hmm. Nobody would click on that. 
we talk about the strategies you can use. And so it's kind of four days, September 6th through the 9th, of the ultimate um, you know, R&D event, if you want to learn what we do on everything about global citizenship. In the last two years we've brought these events back, people, they say like their heads explode. <laughs> no, it's really, I think one day on Thursday, we go from eight in the morning to like 10, 30, or 11 at night. It's nonstop, because there's just so much I wanna, I wanna teach people. And then we've got some folks like you. We've got Jim Rogers coming, uh, the adventure capitalist. He was talking about this 25 years ago, where to invest. So if you wanna find some far flung places to invest, he'll be there. Mark Faber, boom, uh, boom doom and gloom. Uh, you know, you're coming. Uh, Mark Moss is coming. Uh, he's lived overseas, he ultimately chose to go back. So he's gonna talk about that perspective. So it's kind of the hard knowledge, as well as what I think is important is the soft knowledge. I wrote a book, I talked more about the soft knowledge, stories, inspiration, what to consider. That's important to me as well, because if you don't have that, we're talking about mindset this whole time, right? If you don't know like what to expect, if you don't know how to adjust, like you're just gonna go home and give up on this whole stuff. Mm -hmm. I've somehow been able to be learning and, and doing more of this for 15 years because I, you know, I guess I had the right approach. So it's four days of a lot of knowledge on everything offshore, everything global citizenship, everything second passport, everything, plus some fun. You're gonna be talking about your experiences. It's unique experiences. I mean, Saudi Arabia, it's not one most people think about. Mm -hmm. Dubai is kind of becoming more talked about. And yet I think that we've had clients where it's like, actually they're gonna double their taxes if they move to Dubai because they have a certain kind of income. And this idea that there should be any one catch all, whether it's Portugal, whether it's Estonia, whether it's Dubai, I think that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. We shatter that, so it's four days, a lot of good food, hundreds of great people, and um, it's nomadcapitalist.com slash live. Awesome. And, and by the way, there's no sponsors. We don't accept sponsors. Um, nobody can pay to speak. Um, I do work with some of the folks who are, you know, some of them are our team. A few of them are people that we, we work with. Some of them are just people like yourself. But most of the things in the offshore industry, it's just one guy after the next. So he's got a teak plantation for sale. And the next one has houses in Panama you can buy. There's none of that. Okay. So you're gonna pay a little bit more to come because that's the only money we make. And we put as much of it into getting great speakers, great food, great hotel, great experience, and none of it into, hey, what are we selling them? We'll mention what we do, but we're not even gonna be handing out order forms for anything. Because I just said, let's focus on having a great event. And I can tell you, I don't really see that almost anywhere else. That's awesome, man. I'm really looking forward to it. I've never been to uh, Kuala Lumpur before. I've never been to, uh, I've only been, to, I haven't been to East Asia yet. I've only been to, I've been around the Middle East a lot. Yep. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to, looking forward to it, looking forward to speaking, looking forward to connecting with people. So if you're listening to this, which of course you are, then what's the, uh, what's the website to get tickets? Well, they should go to nomadcapitalist.com slash live and the promo code Zuby. Yes. Because you get a special, you know, we'll, you, you'll really be taken care of very nicely uh, with promo code Zuby. So nomadcapitalist.com slash live. And by the way, we could have kept doing these in Mexico. We did the last two events, Nomad Capitalist Live. And many years ago, we had a different event that was also in Mexico. And Mexico treated us very well for a while. I said, this is a place people need to see, Kuala Lumpur. And the proof is in the pudding. I've been there for almost a decade. I have property there. I think it's one of the hidden gems, quite frankly. If, if Asia is your thing, uh, or you're open to Asia, you got to come and see it. Go to Prince Court, perhaps, the day before, but nomadcapitalist.com slash Zuby. Go to Singapore afterwards, by the way. They got banking. They got, you know. So we could, we could talk all about <laughs> global citizen sandwich and everything else, but we'll be talking about that at the event. Uh, nomadcapitalist.com slash live, promo code uh, Zuby. Awesome. And Andrew, where can people find and follow you online? Uh, so nomadcapitalist.com, we've got over 1,500 articles, uh, Nomad Capitalist on YouTube, we've got more than 2,300 videos. I wrote a book called Nomad Capitalist on Amazon, which again is less hard knowledge and more just stories and things to think about and ideas to get you started. Uh, so we're really everywhere. We, we, <laughs> I, we've, I, my thing has been like, let's just be everywhere and it's been exhausting at times, but uh, there's a lot of information. Awesome, man. I appreciate what we do, man. Hey, my pleasure. Good appreciate to see it. you. Nice one.